الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام الحمد لله الذي يتم النعمة وأكمل الدين الحمد لله على نبينا محمد المبعوث رحمة للعالمين والصلاة والسلام عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى أصحابه الغر المحجلين وعلى التابعين وتابعيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم واجعلنا منهم يا رب العالمين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر طيب in case nobody knows me my name is Abu Ali and I am the Imam here I have to do this because normally in a lecture or something we have to recite some Quran which I did when I recited the Surah Al-Asr and we introduced the speaker which I did Alhamdulillah so we overlooked that part and we can dedicate the rest of the time for the lecture itself the importance or the significance of the Arabic language. Before I <coughs> enter into this subject, I uh, 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 should uh, uh, emphasize that this is a big subject. One lecture or two or three or even ten is not going to be enough to cover it. So do not expect me to go into the details of many of the topics, but rather I will be touching on these uh, uh, topics quickly because of the limit of time, number one. Number two, I know unfortunately that we Muslims have been divided along national lines and this is the work of the colonial infidels who have invaded Muslim lands and divided Muslims and spread the idea of nationalism amongst them. And that is why for those who are secular or those who are not religious, like this, this might be a sensitive topic. Some might perceive it as Arabs self-praising themselves or that this is basically uh, talking about a certain nation and uh, basically about the Arabs and that uh, uh, this talk is a nationalistic talk. It is not. Anybody who has any fantasies about that have to reject his Islam and his deen. The Arabic language is the language of Islam. It is not the language of the Arabs. There is a difference between Arabic language as a national language and Arabic language as a religious language of Wahi, of Al-Quran and as sunnah uh, Even though the statement that people usually uh, repeat, تَعَلِّمُوا أَبْنَاءَكُمُ الْقُرْآنَ أو تَعَلَّمُوا الْقُرْآنَ فَإِنَّهُ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ It is not uh, actually a hadith, but it is a true statement. Teach your children or learn the Arabic language because it is part of part of Islam and historically that's the situation that was in the Muslim lands there is nobody in the first Hijri century who is not Arab by the way Persian or Kurdish or uh, uh, Coptic or Nubian or uh, Amaziri or any of those who entered into Islam in the first century who looked at Arabic language as a language that is alien to them when they, when they became, became Muslims. We in Palestine, in Syria, will not speak Arabic before the Islamic uh, Fath, if you will, of the uh, greater Syria at the time of Umar ibn Khattab. The prevailing language was the Aramaic uh, uh, language, even though Arabic was spoken as a second language and was spoken in certain areas among the Bedouins in the desert, basically, but in the major centers, of Syria, like uh, Jerusalem, and uh, Yafa, and Haifa, and uh, Damascus, and Aleppo, and Beirut, and these areas, people spoke Aramaic, or Sanskrit. Uh, when they became Muslim, learning Islam was part of their Islamization, part of their becoming Muslims. And they never looked back at their previous languages as being national languages or important to them after they became Muslim, because basically, uh, 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 their religion was the single most important thing in their lives that they're willing to dedicate anything for. So, Arabic is not and should not be perceived as a national language, even by the Arabs themselves, by the way. And like I said, the way that the, uh, nowadays we have <coughs> national tensions among Muslims, uh, sometimes they uh, uh, use language, they abuse language actually, rather, rather than use language, in order to uh, distinguish 
their identities and their uh, nationalities. For example, in Iraq, <coughs> the struggle was whether to keep the Kurdish language for the Kurds to speak Kurdish and use it in schools and universities or to use Arabic. Those who were ultra-nationalists were rejecting the idea of using Arabic in schools and in, in Kurdish areas where the Kurds are the majority and they thought that this is threatening their national, uh, national identity. Uh, even nowadays in, in, uh, in North Africa, in Morocco and Tunisia and uh, uh, Nigeria, the, uh, those who have, who still speak a Mazili uh, language, Berber language, even though it's not one language, it's different dialects and it's, you know, still the ultra-nationalists among them look at Arabic language as a threat that is threatening their, their identity and uh, their national, uh, national identity. This is a new trend. It was not like this before. If you go to the first Hijri century and the second Hijri and the third Hijri, and part of the fourth century, you will find that Arabic language was the language in all of the Muslim lands. Anybody who wants to write a book, by the way, it was not forced on people. There was no law that says you have to write a book in Arabic. But it was known that Arabic is the language of Islam. So anybody who wants to write a book on Islam, he will write it in Arabic. And anybody who wants to study Islam, he is going to study Islam through Arabic through Arabic language. When I give classes usually in uh, highly specialized subjects like Usul al-Fiqh or Ilm al tawheed I usually <coughs> tell uh, the students that it's very hard to speak in English about these things simply because we do not have translations for the terminology in particular. Okay? If you want to uh, 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 put a translation for uh, Usul al-Fiqh terms, for example, anywhere that you go, you will not find, even among, you know, uh, uh, languages that Muslim speaks, Urdu or Persian or whatever, you will find that they use the same Arabic uh, terminology that the, those who speak Arabic use. And then it occurred to me, why don't I start doing that myself, making it easier for non-Muslims, you know, to learn also and to learn, and I thought that I would be doing Islam a service, you know, if I do that. But then again, I thought about it. And I said, those, our ancestors were not stupid, you know, and we are not more smart, we are not smarter than them. They deliberately didn't do that. They deliberately did not translate the Qur'an. You know that. Well, if, if you look at the translations of the Qur'an, you will find that the oldest of them is how many years old? It's maybe a couple of hundred years. Okay, you will not find an Urdu translation of the Qur'an that is 1,000 years old. Why? Deliberately, deliberately, because they wanted to learn the Arabic language of the Quran and they want to keep the Quran as it is. If you want to read it, read it as it is. If you want to understand it, go and learn the, the language that it was revealed in. Later on, you know, it's, and, and again, uh, it might not be a service to translate the Quran the way that it is translated uh, uh, right now. Now, uh, these two points I wanted to focus on that. This is a big subject and second that this is not, we're not talking about a national language and we're not talking about nationalities and the nationalism from the point of view of Islam is rather. Prophet says, Leave it because it is rather. To have a pride because of your origin, because you somehow were born, you know, in a certain language or in a certain nation and to think that you are better than other people is a, some sort of uh, mental and social sickness. You are what you are because of what you achieve, not because of things that were forced on you and were given to you without anybody asking uh, you your opinion. This is number one. But second point, historically, Arabic language uh, uh, to most linguists is about 8,000 years old. If you uh, uh, look at some all the sources that are written by Islamic scholars in the past, you will say that many of them will tell you that Arabic is Tawqifi language and is not Tawfiqi language. It's a language that was invented or revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why it is the language of people of Jannah. 
And that is why the language of the Wahy, of the Quran. So, uh, they say that the Arabic language is a language that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught to Adam. وَعَلَّمَ Adama and Asma'a kullaha and so on. Now, this is a claim. You might find some uh, reports or some opinions by statements by the Sahaba that will uh, 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 emphasize this uh, uh, understanding or this uh, hypothesis. But if you want to scrutinize it scientifically and historically, uh, the second opinion is that language, Arabic language started with Ismail. Ismail alayhi salam, the son of Ibrahim, awwala, aw awwalu man futiqa lisana hu bil arabiyya. He is the first one who spoke the, uh, 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 the Arabic language. If that is, <coughs> if that is the case, and now it's going to depend how you take your calendar and how you estimate, estimate that. Uh, but Ibrahim is about uh, 5,800 years, 6,000 years uh, uh, before uh, Isa alayhi salam, which is about 8,000 years today. Now, I'm talking about the spoken Arabic. The, the, the written Arabic is, is way less than that. It's about 22, 2300 years old. And the written form of Arabic was taken from Al-Nabatiyya, Nabatians. Nabatians is a Semitic uh, uh, tribe that resided in northern Hijaz, what is known today as uh, Tabuk, for example, and, and Hagel, and, and, and these areas in Saudi Arabia, and in uh, southern uh, Jordan, Man, Tafili, and, and that area, Batra is one of their places. There was a civilization there that was called the Nabatian. Uh, and the <coughs> uh, 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 Nabatians also are the, uh, uh, the mother of the Hebrew writing system. Okay? So if you see the Arabic alphabet, in Arabic, I mean the alphabet, if you compare the Arabic alphabet to the Hebrew alphabet, to the Nabatian alpha alphabet, you will find that they are almost the same. In Arabic we say Alif, when, when you talk about the first letter A, the equivalent of the English, Alif. In Hebrew, Hebrew it is Alif. Okay. In Nabatian it's also Alif, and it means what? The cow or the bull. Alif means uh, tame or domestic. Bait in Hebrew. Ba in Arabic, and bite means house, you know, as uh, you know. Gim, gamel. Gamel means camel. Gim uh, in Arabic, and so on. And like I said, that's about 22, 2300 years ago. Actually, I took a course in uh, Arabic calligraphy uh, back in uh, 79, 1979. And we were presented with the oldest Arabic script at that time, that was found, and that was the writing that was discovered on the tomb of Umre Uqais. Umre Uqais is a famous Arab poet about, I'd say, maybe 400, 500 years before the Prophet And it says, هذا قبر Umre Uqais, Amir al-Arab. This is the tomb of Ibn Al-Qais, the Prince of Arabs, and under it there are two lines of poetry, I forgot them, but basically it curses the one who moves these bones around or who take them out, you know, or, you know, or something like that. But if you look at it, it hardly resembles anything that we know about Arabic now, <laughs> nowadays. The wow, for example, uh, is just a, just a circle that doesn't have any tails to it, you know, up, uh, up or down. The uh, fa and kaf and ain are, are almost the same, they are correct. <clears throat> There's no difference, you know, between them. Uh, I heard that they found a, a, a script in, uh, in Sinai where they were digging for some uh, gold or some uh, expensive metals, fayuz or something like that. And they found a script that is about 4,000 years old. I didn't see it. But they say that it's also an ancient. Uh, ancient Arabic. I would doubt that, that because 
up to now, the, the, the opinion of most of the scholars when it comes to the calligraphy or the writing system is that it is the Nabatean, it's a Nabatean system. And the Nabateans were about you know, 2,500 years ago when they, you know, when they, uh, when they prevailed. Now, the calligraphy of Arabic language, of course, evolved from the oldest form, which is the Kufi uh, Arabic. Uh, of course, there were no dots at that time, no movements, Fatha and Kasra and Dhamma, or you know, anything like that. And these were added, you know, uh, later on. And then more styles uh, were developed in the Nasir, or the Thuluf, or the Diwani, or the Diwani Jani, or the Haani, and other forms. And basically, most of these were developed in order to uh, uh, write the copies of the Quran artistically, you know, trying to decorate buildings and, and you know, and things like, uh, uh, like that. And also because the, the Arab, Arabs became in touch with other civilizations, like the Persians, for example, who adopted the Arabic calligraphy and used it and tried to distinguish it from the, uh, uh, the Kufi, the original Arabic, <coughs> Arabic uh, uh, calligraphy. Uh, so the, the Arabic language is about 8,000 years old, the spoken Arabic. And the spoken Arabic, again, I don't want to go into the, and turn this into a linguistic uh, lecture. Uh, it's not one. There is the ancient Arabic, there is the Hamyari Arabic of Yemen, there is the northern Arabic of, you know, the Ismailites, and so on. When the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, came with Islam, Arabic was at its peak at that time. Because here you have a whole nation, and those are the Arabian tribes that were in the Arabian Peninsula, dedicating all of their skills and dedicating all of their efforts when it comes to civilization to their language. Normally, every civilization has a cornerstone. It has a focal point that they focus on. The Greeks, for example, were philosophers they emphasized ideas and philosophy and thinking, and they dedicated the, the intelligentsia among them, dedicated their writing and their effort to advancing the uh, art of uh, philosophy. The Romans are people of building. <coughs> you see there are Romans everywhere, there are amphitheaters and, <coughs> and buildings, you know, everywhere. The Arabs excelled in what? In the language. And they dedicated their if for those who were intelligent among them became speakers, you know, or they became laureates, or they became poets. So much so that they would hold conferences, annual conferences in different places in order to compete among themselves when it comes to the uh, ability to use the Arabic, the Arabic language. They, they would meet in Mecca, for example, in a place called Souq or Kalf. It's a marketplace that used to be established annually in Mecca. They will come from different places, usually with their goods. You know, they have some uh, uh, clothes, clothes, for example, to sell over there. But at the same time, they will bring with them their most eloquent poets and speakers so that they will display their skills with, you know, the Arabic language. And then they will end, choosing, end up choosing the most eloquent uh, 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 poet. And those who were most prominent among them, they will give them the honor of keeping their poems in the Kaaba. You know that there are uh, poems that are known as Al-Mu'allakat. And Al-Mu'allakat means those that were pinned down. They were hanged in the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Kaaba. The most famous among them are seven. There were more than seven, but those are the most famous, uh, uh, famous Mu'allakat. So when the Prophet والسلام, came, he came, you know, at a time when the Arabic language was at its utmost and highest uh, peak and point. And that is one of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to challenge the Arabs in the Arabic language. The Quran, the, the eternal miracle of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged people in what? Doing what? Bringing about a, a kitab, a book, like the Quran. And of course, they put it. <coughs> Then he challenged them to bring about 10 chapters to the Ashri Surah. They put it. Then he made it easy for them to come up with one Fatu Surah in Mithli. And they put it. Not only they put it, but they admitted that they tried and they and they couldn't. So that was the uh, 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 
miracle of Islam uh, uh, being an Englishman. And language was, like I said, the cornerstone of the culture of the Arabian Peninsula. It is what people uh, uh, got their status from. It is what people uh, uh, prided themselves uh, of. It's what people competed with one another, you know, uh, based on it is what they dedicated their efforts in order to, in order to keep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, I think this is, I'll move on to uh, uh, in, uh, the next uh, subject here, has chosen the Arabic language for a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. Allah knows best where to start his message. What people to choose and what language to choose and what circumstances to, to choose. Now we know that politically, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Arabia, which was neither part of the Persian Empire nor the Roman Empire. It was a neglected corner, if you will, you know, at that uh, time uh, politically. Nobody even thought of invading it or making it part of it because there was nothing, like I told you, these people prided themselves in language and talk, basically. They didn't have any major cities. They didn't have any major buildings, they did not have a thriving uh, agricultural uh, uh, production or industrial you know, production or anything like that. And they are very hard to control because those were nomads. And most of the cases moving from one place to, uh, uh, to another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started his message with this geographical place, with this people, and using the Arabic language. And this leads us to quickly talk about some of the features of the Arabic language that makes it suitable for Islam. Now, we know that in Islam there is something that is called ijtihad. Ijtihad. And ijtihad means that you try to get to exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me. That's basically what ijtihad is. What is he telling me to do or not, or not to do? And that is a process. It is a thinking, a thinking process. Now you need a tool to use in order to, <clears throat> to do ijtihad. Now there are many tools. The most important amongst them is knowledge of the Arabic language. For a language to be a legal code in itself, notice, the Arabic language is a legal language from the point of view of Islam. I want, I want to emphasize this point because it has become a, a common statement among Muslims to say, look at the Quran, there is only 300 ayahs or 70 ayahs that are legal. The rest of it is talks about akhlaq or talks about abid. That is not true. Every letter in the Quran has legal significance. So if you read the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَّ الْمِحْرَابِ وَجُدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقَةِ are there any laws in there, in this ayah? No. Well, this is Akhbar. Allah is telling us about Zakaria entering the chamber where uh, uh, his adopted daughter, uh, Maryam, was. And every time he enters there, he will find some risk. So where is the legal side to it? The legal side of it is the structure. So if you see the word Dekhal in another hadith, or in another, and you know what is the legal meaning of Dekhal, you might go back to if you find a statement, a hadith that says kullama, such and such happened, such and such happened. What is the meaning of kullama? Legal, from a legal point of view. Does it mean specification? Does it mean generalization? Does it mean you go to the ayah of kullama? Dakhala alayha. Dakhala ala. What does, does it exactly mean? Is it different from dakhala fi? Dakhala fi and so on. You go to the Quran. So every letter on the Quran has legal significance because Arabic language itself became the legal language of, of Islam. And that is why the study of Arabic language is basically the study of the legal code of Islam. But what kind of study of language we're talking about? And many people are thinking, Alhamdulillah, Allah has created me an Arab, I speak Arabic. <laughs> Don't be very proud. <laughs> this, this is not what we're talking about. The Arabic language and the study of the, the Arabic language is the uh, study of the Arabic sciences, not the ability to say certain, certain words and think that you are, you know, you're speaking Arabic. 
the sciences of uh, 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 Arabic language, like Ilm al dalalat for example. Ilm al dalalat or Ilm al-Ma'ani, or Ilm al badiah or Ilm al nahw or Ilm al-Sarf. These are the sciences of Arabic language. If you want to study Arabic language as a legal language and as a tool of understanding the Quran, not simply, you know, learning how to speak it, especially if you're learning to speak the uh, Daraj or the uh, Ammi, the colloquial, the, the, the everyday street, uh, street Arabic. If you have done that, you have not achieved anything towards understanding, you know, the Quran. Here, again, it might be learning a national language or learning the ability to communicate with a certain people rather than learning uh, uh, to understand the Quran and the Sunnah. If you want to understand the Wahy, the revelation, then you, and you become a mujtahid and a scholar of Islam, then you have to study the sciences of Arabic, uh, 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 Arabic language. And that goes for everybody, whether you, your original language is Arabic or your original language is French or it is uh, Urdu or it is the same thing. And the <coughs> good teacher of Arabic language who wants to teach his students to become scholars of Islam should treat them as the same. As a matter of fact, those who do not speak Arabic might have a plus, you know, than those who uh, speak it. Because those who speak it usually they speak a corrupt, you know, form of, of Arabic language. One guy told me that he went uh, for training with the Marines. And then the, the, the officer asked them, they were a bunch of them, of course, that, you know, their, their first day. And then he asked them, those, who knows how to fire, you know, an M16 or a clashing gun? Some, some of them raised their hands. He told them to go aside. Then he said, those who do not know how to fire an M16, you can start your course right away. Those who know how to fire the M16, you need a, a, a two-week course before you join them, because I want to teach you to forget what you have learned already. Because all you have learned is wrong. <laughs> After two weeks, and then you join the other people, you know, and from there you, you know, you start, uh, you start learning. That's exactly the case of those who speak colloquial or who speak uh, everyday Arabic language when they want to study ilm al you know, or they want to study balaba, or they want to study arud, or any one of the sciences, you know, of the. Uh, 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 of the Arabic language. So the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen this language to be the legal, the legal language of wahi, of the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in itself gives uh, uh, Arabic language uh, uh, a huge, a huge importance. Because you want what, to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you. You want to understand what this wahi is, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you without going to a third party or you know, a third person. Because religion by nature is a personal thing. You want to you know, understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, is telling you. Now, so geographically Allah has chosen this area, the Arabian Peninsula. Critically it was apart from the uh, urban world, civilized world at that time and what's going on with the wars. And, you know, and, and he chose in the Arabic language, he chose those people who are by nature nomads. Don't think that all the Arabs, by the way, were nomads at the time. They were the cities of Ta'if and the cities of Mecca and Tabuk and the, the Arabs of Yemen, for example, had their cities and they had their, their thriving agricultural uh, civilization. So not all of them were nomads, but you can say that the uh, general uh, prevailing lifestyle at that time was being a Bedouin or being a nomad. That in itself, even though by our standards today is a bad thing, you know, for people who want to carry a message, might be the best people. Why? Because they are not attached to a certain piece of land that they care about. You know, some military uh, specialists say that the agricultural based civilizations, state like India, for example, Egypt, for example, they have the best soldiers when it comes to what? Defense. Put them, you know, and their homelands behind them to defend it, and they will do the best job. Why? Because they have this attachment, this passion for their land. They feel that they are preserving their and, and fighting for their own identity. 
But send them to fight in a world war, for example, in Europe. They will be the lousiest. Why? Because each one of them is telling himself, well,